Amen. Good morning, guys. You think we should do a, a building expansion project? <laughs> All of you who did not get a seat, uh, our giving boxes are... No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hey, my name is John, and I'm the lead pastor here, part of a great team. And uh, hopefully you did, as Pastor Chris said, get one of these cards. We are uh, in the process of taking the building next door over. We have told you and told you. Uh, through my West Coast ambition that we were going to try to get this wall down before Christmas and move our older kids to our building next door. The owner of the building uh, next door needs a little more time. So all of you who signed up uh, to knock this wall down, um, we encourage those with anger problems to sign up. Just hold on a little bit longer. We're going to update you as soon as the, the owner, uh, he's shutting his business down for us. So we can take this building over. This is the favor of the Lord. And so as soon as uh, he's ready, we'll let you know. We'll get back on this wall. We're going to expand this into our new auditorium. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited. And then our older kids will be up there. Uh, we just increased our children's ministry staff as well. So everything is going well. Um, if you notice, when you pulled up, there's some, uh, there's some stuff in front of that building out there. That's the owner getting this stuff out. He's getting ready. So we're very excited. You may see, uh, if you pick your kids up from time to time, something a little different in the back. Our contractor is starting work in the back. And you can start work with us by praying about getting involved with our kids' ministry or giving. Uh, check out our sermon last week. It goes through all of that. But today, I'm excited to preach this message. So go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. And then uh, 2 Thess Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians 4, and then go ahead and jump over to Proverbs. Did you get that? Come on, come on, come on. No, I'm teasing. Uh, go to Philippians 4, and if you don't know what a Philippian is, don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll explain all this. We'll put our verses up here. No matter how old you are, I will make this understandable by the grace of God uh, so you can enjoy and apply this sermon. I'm in a really good place in my soul today. Um, because of this message, and we really had a, a powerful experience this morning at 8.30, at our 8.30 service. So I want to talk to you about uh, thankfulness. How many of you guys grew up in church? Just raise your hands, any type of church. You're probably right now turning me off. You're like, really? oh man, the Thanksgiving sermon. <laughs> this one is always so Pinterest bumper sticker, and it's lame. Well, I'm going to open up something you, I guarantee you've never heard that can really change your life. And we're going we're gonna to we're gonna call it turning the tables on Thanksgiving. You see what I did there? Tur all right, all right. It's turning the tables on Thanksgiving. If you're, not, uh, if, you're, if you're from Germany or you're not familiar with Thanksgiving, I think everybody does uh, have some familiar, familiarity with Thanksgiving. <clears throat> I did not grow up in a traditional home. I grew up in an atheist home in a non-traditional uh, American home, even though we had a strong military background. So uh, Thanksgiving for us was a combination of the Redskins and the Cowboys playing. Amen? Now, if you're a Cowboys fan, we don't got to talk about it. Not everyone can have Russell Wilson. I know that. I'm very aware of that. Hey, all right. Go Hawks is right, my Northwest people. Um, but my mom, she, she cooked like a Southern lady. Like she took all the, the grease and all the fat and rolled it into gravy. You know what I'm saying? Like that was your gravy. We don't worry about artery clogging nothing. We got after it on Thanksgiving. Um, and we really didn't have like a tradi traditional, like, like let's get around the table and thank because we were watching the Cowboys. Um, so I want to unpack something a little bit different to you and really make this life changing. I, I got to say it's wonderful to be around someone who's thankful. You know when you're around that person, they're almost annoying. And just like everything's like, oh, I just thank, I'm so thankful for this. And then if they bring God in it, if they're a Jesus follower, they're like, yeah, and God this and God that. And um, it's, it's, it's contagious but annoying. But at the same time, we all want to be in that space. We all want to be in that space. The antithesis is when there's a group of you and you're killing it, you're rocking the house, and everything's going really well, and that one negative person walks in. They kill the whole vibe in the room, can't they? Like there's 80 of you and you're just like, yes, him. And that one person comes in, they're like, yes, him, but I'm a realist. And all of a sudden, they can wipe the slate clean. So let me ask you the, this question. Is thankfulness a truly powerful thing or not? Yes. Is this not just pie in the sky stuff we should be teaching our kids in the back? 
How important is thankfulness for a 16-year-old whose grades suck and they're trying to figure out high school? Or a single 25-year-old who's trying to figure out the rhythm in life? Or if you're at Frontline, a married couple with 16 kids and, and uh, <laughs> we love your kids. We're getting them a building. <laughs> but how about the 72-year-old who's, who's retiring? How, how critical is Thanksgiving or, or a pastor of a church? I mean, how critical is this stuff? And, and let me just test the waters. Let's test it a little bit. Would you say that you're a thankful person? Raise your hand if you're a thankful person. If you're sitting next to the person with their hand raised, raise your hand if they're a liar. <laughs> I'm teasing. Stop. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Let's test it. If, I, if you were to walk in these doors and I were to ask you, how was your week? How was your week? Ooh, what would you say? Great. All right, you're doing that because it's a Thanksgiving sermon. <laughs> now, some of you do say that, but think about it. That's the real test. Where does our mind go? Not to diminish problems, but where does our mind go when someone unpacks a question like that? How was your week? How was your day? Hey, honey, how was your day? Uh, do we have this default mechanism that goes to all the things that we weren't satisfied with? Is any of this important? Well, I was reading on this. Um, I love reading on psych, psychology for some reason. I don't know why, because uh, I see so much of it in the scripture. But uh, I was reading this, this article written by a PhD, and, and she said that uh, negative attitudes, feelings of hopelessness, cynicism, a critical spirit, you ready for this? are actually shortening the ends of your DNA strands. Now, for a lot of us, we're like, huh? Is that bad or good? <laughs> That's what we lay people call death. That is called death. In essence, stress. Aren't you glad you came this morning? Yeah. Stress, negativity, hopelessness are literally breaking down the physical body and they know, they know that it is rapidly increasing the process of aging. Like I'm really like 12 years old right now. It's just been hard for a few years now. <laughs> but if, if, you think about, if you think about this principle, uh, throw up Proverbs 17, verse 22. I remember when I first became a Jesus follower, I grew up an atheist, went to church for the first time when I was 20 because uh, I tried everything and I thought I was a smart Seattle kid. My dad was a genius, and he taught us all the great arguments. And I remember walking in as a miserable young man who was completely void of any type of thankfulness or happiness. I didn't know where to find it because life was two-dimensional to me without God. It was me in this world. It was, and I'll get back to this in a minute. Just leave it up. That's a good one to med meditate on. It was me in this world, you see. So when I came off the stage of life and I was faced with, a, with an issue in my life, I didn't, I didn't know how to find joy because it was me in my situation, it was, that was it. And then as a Jesus follower, God empowers, and if you're not a Jesus follower, let me entice you a little bit here. God empowers you to add another, another level of this, like a 3D world. All of a sudden now, you start seeing how God is working in all circumstances and how awesome he is. And now you can start looking at a circumstance and you start going, okay, I can actually be thankful. As weird as it sounds, I can actually be thankful for this. We came from San Francisco. I'm a Northwest guy, but we were in uh, the belly of the beast for a while, and uh, you'll get that later. And I, I took our young adults to a play in San Francisco. We saw the Christmas Carol. Anybody seen the Christmas Carol, like on stage? Brilliant play. And uh, because they're young adults, I went cheap. They don't know any better. <laughs> our young adults are going to kill me for that. And so we were in like the fifth balcony <laughs> on the very sides. So like... Parallel with the stage. Now, I was groaning and mumbling and thinking, oh, this is so lame. Why, did I, why didn't I pay like four extra bucks a ticket? And then I realized that I had the best seats in the house. The reason I got the best seats in the house is because everybody who's in the mosh pit or whatever they call that in the operatic scene, they're just looking at the stage two-dimensionally. All they can see is actors and curtains. But what I have because of my position, I'm teaching the Bible right now, is I can see behind the scenes. I see actors and props, and I see all the crew behind the scenes moving things around and preparing the actors in the play for the next scene. That's like Christianity. 
You've got these situations and these circumstances, and it's like, how can I thank God for that? How can I, how can I be thankful for that? But when you become a Jesus follower, when he's woven behind all circumstances, pretty soon you, you can start seeing behind the scenes of what he's doing. And actually with, with quivering lips at times and, and like, a, you know, kind of this face, you're like, man, I can't thank God for this. And I want to teach you that today. But here's the importance of a thankful spirit. Proverbs 17 and verse 22 A joyful heart is good medicine. That's DNA talk. God is the God of the sciences, you see. A joyful heart is a good medicine. Joy and thankfulness actually perpetuate life. But a crushed spirit dries the bones. That's that's death. How important is this now? That we learn the joy and power of a thankful soul. But here's the problem. Here's the problem with the lack of thankfulness. You guys, if there isn't any hope, there isn't any points. And if there isn't any points, there isn't any progress. And that's a scary place to be. And I want to say this with love because I care about you. I've been praying deeply for us as a church. Some of you guys feel that way about things right now. And I'm not making light of that. I'm here to help. Some of you feel that way right now And I'm going to challenge you and encourage you that a thankful heart can and will change all of that. Now, go to Philippians 4. Let me show you this. We're going to be all over the Bible today. Philippians chapter 4. Paul's my hero. Jesus is my hero. But Paul's my hero. He was an early church writer, and he wrote most of the New Testament. These are letters written to churches to teach them how to live life. And there's this great verse In Philippians 4.12, I told you last week, there are secrets in this world, guys. There are secrets in this world. And very few ever tap into those secrets. And because we fail to tap into those secrets, we struggle in life. And the weird thing is these secrets are right under our nose. We just need, we need someone to lead us to the lock and the key. So look at this in Philippians 4. And man, if this doesn't encourage you, verse 12, Paul goes like this. What if this was Monday, guys? This can be yours. I know how to be brought low. I know how to get I know how to get punched in the gut. I know how to be fired. I know how to get the diagnosis. I know how to have a struggling teen. I know how to have a struggling parent. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. I know I know how to be blessed. I know how to prosper and not lose my way. In any and every circumstance I have learned the secret. Oh, how few tap into the secret. Of facing plenty and facing hunger, hunger, abundance and needs. Let's unlock the secret today. How do you live a life that you're unmoved and strong? Well, let me me give it to you very with with simplicity this morning. I want to show you how to be thankful in all circumstances. How to be thankful in all circumstances. Write that down. How to be thankful in all circumstances. And right away you're like, okay, this is back to Pinterest bumper sticker stuff. You cannot tell me that I should be thankful in all circumstances. You know, one of the problems that happened to us is we grew up. And in growing up, we stopped believing. And I don't mean fairy tales, although C.S. Lewis says we would be good to start believing fairy tales again. But we stopped believing in the power of God because we started listening to the world. And let me not criticize you or speak for you, but I want you to be careful. You're saying... Come on, that's pie in the sky stuff. I'm not even supposed to be thankful in all circumstances. That's not reality, friends. That is more real than anything we know. It is reality. So go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let me introduce you to a church and how all hell broke loose in their lives and how Paul told them to do just this, be thankful in all circumstances. 2 Thessalonians in verse 1. Let me breeze through this. I don't want to get into this too much for the sake of time. But as we read this letter, this is the second letter, that's why we call it Second Thessalonians, to a group of Jesus followers like us in Thessalonica. And Paul, the general, writes them this letter. But things are not exactly going well for this young church. And if you're struggling, I want you to feel this. God understands. In, uh, in verse 1, uh, chapter 1, excuse me, verse 5, Paul writes this. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Did you get it? 
You've been, you've been brought into the kingdom of God. You're Jesus' followers, but you are still getting your butts kicked. Bless you. You're, you're still going through it. Your marriages are still struggling. You're still, you're still losing jobs. You're still not getting promoted. Verse 6, since indeed God considered it just to repay, repay with affliction those who afflict you. So now people are afflicting this young group of Jesus followers. They're going through life pains. They're being afflicted. And then in verse 7, to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, look up here real quick. Let me explain what just happened. How many of you guys have had a bad week and yet you said to a friend or a spouse, I think we're in the tribulation period. Like, I think Jesus came back and he missed us. And like right now we're in the seven-year tribulation period. Like, I'm so waiting for scorpions to come out of pits right now. Nobody, nobody's gone through enough to say that. This young church actually thinks Jesus came back, they missed him, and they are in the, that's how bad things are. Now, how would you write that type of group of people? We'll go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll camp out on one verse here. Look at what Paul tells them. Here's the, here's the remedy for hard times. Here's the remedy for pain. He goes, rejoice always. Like, psh. Did you just hear? We're in the tribulation period. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Now watch this. this. This baffles me. Give thanks in all circumstances. Everyone's looking for the will of God. Where does he want me? And that's all fine. Where does he want me? Where should I work? That's all fine. But look at this. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Which tells me if it's God's will that we thank him in all circumstances, this has got to be juicy. It's got to be good for us. But my question to you today is, how can we be thankful when so much is not right in our lives? Let's think Thanksgiving. Let me illustrate this. Let me, let me illustrate how to be thankful in all things when things are not the way we want them in our lives. Growing up in my home uh, for Thanksgiving, as I said, we were very non-traditional. But anytime we had an uninvited guest come over for Thanksgiving, it was bad. Like sometimes, I remember my, uh, my sister brought a boyfriend. And uh, they broke up that day. <laughs> yeah, because like my brothers were so bad. Not me, my brothers were so bad. <laughs> like we knew if you came over into our clan, into our tribe, like, we were going to run you out. Uh, I remember a brother uh, bringing, bringing home a girlfriend and introducing her to the family for Thanksgiving. They broke up. I'm not even kidding you. And so in my family, when you would have an uninvited guest come over for Thanksgiving, like two weeks prior, you would call a family meeting. And you would say, look, I'm bringing someone over. I need you, on, I need you sober, number one. And I need you on your best behavior because I really like this person. So uninvited guests on Thanksgiving can be a little tricky. Um, everybody's got a couple of crazy uncles. And, and everybody has had those crazy uncles or whoever show up on Thanksgiving. And, and here's what we do for Thanksgiving. We, we set the table. This is kind of a, this is a low-income table, obviously. But uh, for Thanksgiving, we set up this table. And we've got the meals planned out. And we've got the guest list guys. And we've got... The dessert table, and we got football on, or whatever your jam is, and then all of a sudden we get the knock on the door. And we run to the door thinking, that's my invited guest. That's my invited guest. And so often, it's a little bit like the Hobbit, uh, because everything cool is in the Hobbit, and uh, you, you get a knock on the door, and you open the door, and you go like this. Oh, hi. Can I help you? You know, and they got deviled eggs, no pun intended. They got deviled eggs, and, and they're like, yeah, happy Thanksgiving. And you're like, yeah, why are you here? That's what you're thinking. You're not invited here. And then, like, maybe your mom comes by, and she's like, oh, I invited Uncle Jam. He's here. And, and you're just like, oh. And he hands you the deviled eggs, and he comes in and kicks his shoes off. And you're just like, you are an uninvited guest. Why? I, want, I, I had this idea of this precious time around this precious table. I wrote the script. I chose who, who was going to come to my table. We were going to enjoy this. And you are an uninvited guest and you are screwing up my experience. That's how life works. 
We make the table of life. We set the table. We decide who we want to come in. They're all the good guests. There's no drama. It's all success. It's all comfort. And so often what we get is we get a knock at the door and, uh, and it's an uninvited guest. So here you are. This is life. Much like Thanksgiving, we set it up. Plans and plans and plan and work for hours and here we are and we're going like this. We're like, okay, okay, I'm ready. Here they come. There's going to be a knock any minute. I've got the table set. This is going to be the sweetest experience. I've got the camera set up. We're going we're gonna, to uh, Facebook Live this bad boy. It's going to be so cool. And I worked for days on the pies. And okay, first knock, first knock, the first knock. And the knock of life works something like this. Like, okay, I got the guest list. It's just perfect. Maybe you have an uninvited guest where you go like this. All of a sudden, all of a sudden who shows up at your table of life is, is a job. And you're kind of going like this. Okay. Okay. I uh, didn't, didn't really invite you. Had a, had a different guest in mind when it came to my job. Um, why are you here? Um, I don't get paid enough. I don't, I don't like my coworkers. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Hopefully you guys don't work together. <laughs> but... I didn't invite you. I didn't invite you this way. I had a different guest in mind when, when I set the table for my job. And then, and you go to the door one more time. And uh, this time it's, it's really awkward because um, who's at the door this time? It's an uninvited guest. It's, maybe it's your spouse. <laughs> we'll, put, we'll put your spouse by the edge in case it gets nasty. You can just, just tip, tip him. But you, you go like this, well... When we met, I wanted to invite that version of you at my table of life uh, because we, everything was really cool when we were in the dating stage. And, and uh, this version of you, uh, you're kind, I kind of start, I'm feeling like you're an uninvited guest here. This isn't the narrative I, I this isn't the plan I had. Um, why is this version of you here? And then, you know, I'm just staring at these two, my job and my spouse, and I'm going, Okay, this is kind of uninvited. I really had this idea of this experience. And then, you know, another, another knock at the door, and you're thinking, oh, man, now you're bracing yourself. You're like, that's got to be Uncle Jim. And uh, maybe your next uninvited guest is health. Maybe it's health. And uh, you think to yourself, well, yeah, I always invited health to my table, but it wasn't this version of health. It was good health. And... Uh, and I know it's Thanksgiving, but I don't really feel like us bowing our heads and, and giving thanks right now. I don't like my circumstances. Uh, how in the world can I, can I give thanks? And I want you to write this down. I was thinking about my life a lot this week. And I was thinking about my, my circumstances. Whether it's a job, I don't know who sits at your table. I don't know if you're 16, it's, it's different. If you're 75, it's different. I don't know who sits at your table, and you don't know who sits at mine, but just let's use this for a little bit. You know, most circumstances, my job, my spouse, uh, maybe my health, I don't know, but my job, my spouse, at least, most circumstances are neither good nor bad. It's just a job. It's a job. It's not, it's not necessarily good or bad. It's just a circumstance. My wife is not necessarily good or bad, She's, 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 a, she's, she's a circumstance, and don't tell her that. That sounded terrible. But, but here's the kicker that I'm learning, guys. They're neutral. My wife is neutral. She's a human, and my job is pretty much neutral. It's a job, but we empower these things, these circumstances, to become good or bad based on how we choose to see them. So I'm looking at my job with one direction, one way. I'm just, I'm saying... I see you one way. Why are you here? You weren't invited. I look at my spouse. I look at her one way, one direction, and I say, this is not the guest I wanted. This is not the guest I dated. Why are you here? I look at my health, and I see it from one way. I see it from one way. I say, why do I have these allergies? Why does my throat hurt constantly? Uh, I see it from one way. It's, it's neither good or bad. I empower it to be good or bad by, by the angle I look at it with. Do you understand that? And so if you look at Philippians 4, this is one of the most powerful moves 
of a human being I think I've ever seen. And as, I've, as I have practiced this towards my circumstances, it has literally changed my life, guys. Here's what Paul tells us to, to do in Philippians 4 8. Paul tells us to change our view and find the good in every one of our circumstances. He literally tells us in Philippians 4 to get up and back away from this table and stop just looking at my job like this. I'm not paid enough. I'm not paid enough. I'm not paid enough. I drive an hour. I drive an hour. I drive an hour. He goes, get up and change your view towards that thing. And here's what I want you to do, Philippians 4, 8. He goes, finally, brothers, whatever. That means this is in every circumstance. What I'm about to say is in every single circumstance that we don't like. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, what's true about my job? Get up and stop looking at the pay and say, what's true? What's true is I got a job. And six months ago, I was on my knees begging God for employment. I've got a job. I drive to a place that pays me to do very little. I'm kidding. <laughs> and my rent is always, always, always paid. I always got something left over. I can always go to that German Mexican restaurant and spend eight bucks on a burrito. I can always do a little traveling. When I get up from that one angle of, I wish I made more. I w Paul goes like this whatever's true, what's true about that thing? Whatever is honorable. You know, I'm doing something that's, that is important in this world. I'm taking care of babies. I'm taking care of, of, of something going on in a foreign country. What is honorable in that thing? What, what is just? What is pure? What is lovely about that job? I've seen lives change where I'm at. I'm sending money back home. I'm putting money away for college. Whatever is commendable. If there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, yeah, there's something worthy of praise, and I, I got to change my angle on this thing. I'm like, yeah, but it's a long drive. It's a long drive. Paul goes, get up off that table, start looking at it this way, and say, is there anything worthy of praise? Yes, God, I have a job. He goes, keep moving. There's my wife. I look at her from one angle, and I go like this. You always, in the winter, I say always, we've been here one winter, You always turn the heat on. And like I got sweat stains in all my shirts now. You always turn the heat on. That's not the, I didn't invite you to the party to be that, that guest. And Paul goes like this, why don't you get up and look at her from a different angle? What is true? What's true <laughs> is I got a girl who loves me. What's lovely? That I call her wifey. And my kids call her mom. And she's faithful. What is honorable? The way she treats me. What is just? <laughs> well, you don't deserve her. What is pure? Our love. What is lovely? All the little crazy quirks only I know about. What is commendable if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise? Think on these things. There's so much worthy of praise in that woman. And Paul says, John, just keep moving. He says, health. Yeah, I know you don't want allergies, and I know you don't want a sore throat for 10 years, and, but you breathe in air, and I sustain you, and it could be worse. And if it gets worse, Jesus has your back. It's called the resurrection, little man. He's killed death. Paul just says, you want to be thankful, you just got to get up from the table and start looking at your circumstances from a new angle. Write this down, guys. Take a picture of this. I, I really got into this this week. I just started doing an inventory of my life and started asking myself, what is beautiful? What is true? Think about these things. Write this down. God says, I can give the pleasure back if you release the praise. I will give you the pleasure back in your job. I will give you the pleasure back in your spouse. 
I will give you the pleasure back on how your body is doing. If you'll find the good in it and you'll lift up your voice and praise me, I will enlarge that pleasure one more time. And I wrote this note down to myself. John, maybe what you need in your life isn't the next level of accumulation, but the next level of appreciation. That's medicine to my soul. I want to be a thankful person. And because I believe in God, no matter what circumstance I'm in, God has promised that all things are working together for good. I just got to find it and hold on to it and thank him for it. Write this down, guys. I like this thought right here. Thankful people are not those who have the best of everything. Thankful people are those who see the best in everything. I don't have everything I want, even though talking Thanksgiving, you know, every guest that's at my table of life and every recipe and every ingredient and every recipe at my table of life is all ordained by God. I need every inch of it. It's, it's creating the perfect banqueting table. Even the Bible says, even if my enemy sits at my table, at my right hands, I didn't invite you, but God is actually using it to transform me. And thankful people are not those who have the best of everything in their job, the best of everything in their spouse, the best of everything in their health. Thankful people are those who take a different angle and see it a different way and see the best in everything in every single circumstance, in the job and in the spouse and in the health and whatever else is going on in life. Man, that's where life is found. Amen? I want to be a thankful person. If we believe the gospel, we believe God is doing good things in every single thing in our lives. We got to hunt it down and grab a hold of it and praise him for it. And I, I was talking to my wife. We pulled up. Uh, we, we got home from the mall. We were at the K-Town Mall because I'm thankful for my wife. And so I wanted to go to the mall like high schoolers. And we did until security started following us. No, I'm teasing, but I saw 50 of you there. It's always good to see you. <laughs> On our way home, we had a sweet talk. I'll wrap this up. And I was telling my wife, man, I just want to be thankful. I don't want to be the guy who sees everything I don't have. I want to see the good hand of God in everything that I do have and see it from his angle and thank him for it. We pulled up to our house, and we just sat there in the car and uh, started talking about when we first got to Germany less than a year ago. Two years ago, we were on our knees like really praying, God, where, where are we supposed to be? And God answered that prayer. He brought us to front line. I, I prayed and prayed when I first got here. I just want to be the greatest pastor I can be for you guys. I prayed and prayed that. I was telling my wife, the feedback we get every week just blows my mind. We are staying in an upper room of a family in the church, we were pleading with God to give us the right house, kind of running out of time and all this stuff. And I said, honey, we just pulled into the driveway. <coughs> Praying for a car because we stole the church's car when we first got here. And I look at the car I'm sitting in. My youngest daughter works for me. I'm not sure that's a blessing or not. No, I'm just teasing. She's amazing. And I, I, we just started counting our blessings like the old kid song says. And my wife said the most amazing thing. You remember the prayer list you guys used to have when you were pleading with God? Oh, God, just please come through. Please give me that man. Please give me that woman. Please give us a baby. My wife said this. We are surrounded by things that used to be on our prayer list. And John... We need to stop and thank the Lord again. So I just want to encourage you going into Thanksgiving. As you stir these recipes together, stir up your praise. 
See all your circumstances and find the good in them again and stir up your praise. The Bible says, what a thanksgiving verse. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and thank him. Amen? Let's pray. And I want to open this for you just to spend some time with our great God. What does he put on your heart just to thank him for again? What is that thing? We all have them. Maybe you found yourself complaining about. Would you spend some time with the Lord just remembering the good? If it's a spouse, my friends, you're loved. If it's singleness, my friend, God is working. If it's children, they call you mom and dad. They call you mom and dad. If it's a job, it's enough. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Feel the joy come back. See these things as precious, precious gifts. Tickle tortures and winter nights. An awesome church. Friends who love us. Cars and houses. Killer meals. And Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift our voice to you as one. And we thank you. And I pray that you would walk with us and help us to see that which is good and that which is lovely and that which is beautiful in all circumstances and we hold on to it. And we feel the light of love and joy return as we express it in praise. Do this work in us this morning as we sing this song to you, Lord. May the sound of our voices bless you and please you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.